First of all, the flowers today are in memory of Joe Sauerwein, Julie's father, late father, and we thank Julie and Bob for, for the flowers. Thank you very much. The fellowship hour today is sponsored by membership committee, so please everybody go downstairs afterwards and start mingling and, and uh, have some fellowship together. Then the Lent services we have in the insert, in the, in the purple insert, Alan has done a great job putting everybody and all the services in that, in that uh, list. So please look at it. We're starting actually with the receiving of ashes this coming Tuesday. And Robert, uh, Robert Lorimer. Wednesday. 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 Ash Wednesday. Wednesday. Alan, it's Wednesday, okay? <laughs> it wasn't Tuesday. <laughs> so we Wednesday at 7 p.m. At least everybody's awake, which is good. <laughs> Uh, so 7 p.m. Uh, Reverend Robert Lorimer is going to be our, our pastor for that uh, for that service. Uh, and uh, as we you still have that uh, purple insert, if you turn the other side, there are two upcoming events of interest. One of them is uh, at the Beth Shalom next Sunday at 7 p.m. about uh, the prehistory of the Bible and exploring the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's open to anybody who wants to go there. And if you see just under that, there is an IV Tech continuing education course about also Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you're interested, uh, the first event is free. The other event is, I think, only $18 total. Uh, it's on Thursdays. So please feel free to, to sign up for the second one. The first one, don't even need to sign up. Just show up and, and enjoy the lecture. Uh, Alan is not the president, but he's taking President's Day off tomorrow. So he won't be in the office, the office will be closed. Um, he is the president of our hearts, isn't he? Now, uh, I would, as, as you can very, very clearly see, David Bremer is not with us today. We have somebody who's much nicer looking than he is, and I can say that now he's not here, okay? <laughs> David has made it to Lebanon, and he's with my parents right now. He's doing fine, he's enjoying himself. But he told me, please tell the congregation that still come back to church after I come back. <laughs> so even though you're going to have hear other people talking, they still want to come back. Today we had the pleasure of having Sarah Roloffs here, our, our pastor. <coughs> Sarah comes to us by the way of Korea and then the great state of Iowa. <laughs> yes, Sammy? Because <laughs> <laughs> Sammy was born in Iowa, Sammy. And, and I you did too. You know, so the Hawkeyes. And then she went to Cabin College in Michigan in the same college with Joe and Renee Stumerach met. And uh, now she's here in Bloomington as a chaplain at the Bloomington Hospital, or as well known IU Health Bloomington Hospital. And we're very, very glad to have her here with us today at the party. She has been attending uh, our uh, services with her husband, Justin, and her two kids, Henry, AKA Hank, <laughs> and Sophia. And I think they'll be coming in here pretty soon. They didn't sleep very well last night, so I think Justin's going to have time to get, get them ready to come. <laughs> Probably within the next 10 minutes. Yeah, I hope it's okay. <laughs> uh, now, uh, last two, uh, last two announcements here. Good news, Don Root is, is back home. On a Saturday, but also kind of a good news, uh, Jim McCartney is also home. He's home with, with Jesus. He passed away on Friday. Last Sunday, uh, he had just finished the last chapter of a book he was writing with his sister. And Bob was just reviewing this last chapter, and we, we sent it to him. So he had a chance to read that last chapter. And then early that week, uh, his son and his daughter came and visited him from Arizona and from California. And when I told Ari that I saw his son and daughter there visiting him, she said, I guess he's now ready to go. You know, he, he said goodbye to everybody. And by Thursday, he was very, very, um, just about unconscious. When he last saw him, but he was very peaceful. He was not, not hurting at all, and was just about knocking on heaven's door. 
and Friday morning the doors were open for him. So he is now uh, with Jesus and he is in a much better place. He's not having to suffer any more nausea, vomiting, and, and he's doing really well where he is. So let me start today's worship with a quick prayer for, uh, for Jim, and then we'll have a minute of silence. But before that, we welcome Justin and Sophia, and I don't see Hank here, we go downstairs, but okay. So, uh, let's bow our heads in, in prayer for you. Dear Lord and Savior, we, we thank you very much for this beautiful day. This day that we are enjoying here on earth, but this is also a day that, that you are enjoying with the presence of Jim with you up there. Uh, as he as he talked to you about his, his life, about his wife, his kids, and this small church, keep him in the bottom of your hand and, and take care of him. And uh, lift him up and keep his memory alive in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
And even though sometimes we're not so great at listening to Jesus or understanding what he's saying, he still loves us. And that's the great thing about Jesus. Well, that's the end of the message. <laughs> so thank you for being such great le- er, listeners. Um, we're going to sing a song. Um, I've forgotten which one. Six. Number six. Song number six. <clears throat> Thank you.
thank you again for the opportunity um, to preach here, and um, thank you also for your uh, warm welcome of my family, um, not just today, but, but, but through like, these past weeks. Um, now we're moving into the time of uh, the voicing the, church, uh, the church's um, concerns of the church universal, and also um, the pastoral prayer. So are there any prayer requests? Um, yes. Travel mercies for David and Brenda as they we go cruise through the as they cruise <laughs> the Middle East. Yeah. And of course, we'll um, keep uh, Jim and um, Virginia's family um, mm. and Virginia, especially um, in our prayers. Um, at the end of our prayer, then, um, I'll invite you all to um, say in unison the Lord's Prayer with me. Let's pray. O oh God, you have invited us to pray to you. We thank you that we can be here this morning. We are grateful that you have kept us safe through this winter, through a week of work, of travel, of learning, and of play. We thank you for protecting many of us on the foggy and rainy days of winter. We thank you for shelter and a place to call home, for a furnace that keeps us warm. We are mindful that not everyone in our city has the necessities of warmth and shelter. God, we come to you today as a church who are grieving the death and celebrating the life of Jim McCartney, a beloved member of this congregation. Merciful God, you strengthen us by your power and wisdom. Be gracious to the McCartney family in their grief, as well as Jim and Virginia's friends and this congregation. Surround them with your unfailing love, that in the midst of their grief, so that they may find confidence in your grace and courage to meet the days to come. Grant the McCartney family safe travels we thank you for that Don Root has been able to return home. May you grant that his recovery is swift. We pray for David and Brenda. May they have a wonderful time in Israel and, and throughout the Middle East. Grant them traveling mercies. Keep them safe. And may their transition and travel back to the U.S. be smooth. God, hear our prayers that have not been spoken. Thank you for being a God who listens to the prayers of your people. And let us pray as you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
so many times I'm not even conscious of and appreciative of. Please accept this as our expression of appreciation and thanks and be with us through this week. Amen. Now would you join me please in the, in the scripture for today, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 9 verses in the Pew Bibles, page 772, the large print Bible made page 1555, 1555. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word for them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this man talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? Immediately, Jesus, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? the wrong passage because <laughs> let me find uh, there was a uh, it's from Mark 9 I think this is the, the passage um, that I'll be preaching on after six days Jesus took Peter James and John with him and led them on a high mountain where they are all alone there he was transfigured before him. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. During the summer between my um, sophomore and junior year of college, I spent half of my summer at home in Iowa um, and half of my summer in China um, teaching English. Um, I grew up in a really conservative, um, religiously, politically, socially um, town and, and, and home. Um, in the Christian Forum denomination, um, where I'm a, a pastor, um, women weren't allowed to be ordained um, into the offices of deacon or elder or minister until about 1995. And even in that, it was just in small little pockets around the United States, not everywhere. It wasn't a universal decree. So the issue of women in office was and, and is still pretty raw in my denomination. It's, it's, it's still pretty tender. 
One summer um, afternoon, I went to a local coffee shop with my pastor at my parents' church, and uh, we exchanged pleasantries, <coughs> caught up on the deep, on life, and um, Pastor Bill shared with me um, an update on his kids, and, and then he asked me, so Sarah, you know, what are your future plans? And I went into this quick little summary that, oh, I'm going to China, and then I think after graduation, God's calling me to become a missionary and teach in an international Christian school, and um, I'm just really excited to see where God leads me. And then it's a little bit hard to even describe what happened next. It's, it, it's kind of a blur. Um, I remember hearing my pastor say, Sarah, I think you should become a military chaplain. I think you have the <laughs> gifts to be a minister. <laughs> and then he proceeded to show me in my church's denomination um, magazine that we get maybe every four times a year, of uh, this Korean American woman chaplain. <laughs> and, and I just felt, um, I felt my heart just start burning and rise to my throat and my, my palms felt clammy and I think I remember kind of nervously laughing like, no, 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 that, that's, that's not for me. Um, I don't even know what I think about women in office. I'm pretty sure my grandparent or my grandpa and my mom and dad would, would stop talking to me. Um, we don't have women even in our church or even in our town. None, none of them hold church offices. Uh, no. And I, I don't even remember how the conversation ended, but um, I just, I, I pushed that so far out of my mind. And, and it took over five years of God continually <laughs> intervening into my life um, for me to fully listen to God and, and realize um, his message for, for me in my life. And I can empathize with the disciples in, in our story today. Um, the disciples often come off as pretty dense, even <laughs> dumb, especially when Jesus is trying to talk about and teach them who he is, who he truly is. And what is going to happen in these next weeks and months? The disciples just don't seem to comprehend who Jesus is and why he's here. Even though Jesus repeatedly teaches over and over and over and over and over who, who he is. Our passage in Mark 9, um, it's nestled into a section of Mark, um, chapters 9 through 10, um, that, that I like to call like the way of glory and suffering. It's, Mark has transitioned from focusing on the crowds and, and Jesus' um, power that are displayed in his miracles, and now we're transitioning um, to the disciples and to his upcoming suffering. <clears throat> and within this section of Mark, these, um, Mark 8 through 10, um, there's, there's a pattern that, that repeats three times. And that's the writer of Mark's subtle but not so subtle um, way of telling his readers, this is really, really, really important, so you, so you have to pay attention. And the pattern goes like this. Jesus predicts his own death. The disciples misunderstand. And then Jesus teaches about the cost of discipleship. This pattern happens over and over in just these, these few chapters. But even after all, all of that, the di disciples are still confused. They still don't understand. And a week prior to our passage, Jesus spoke directly to the disciples about his death and suffering. And what Jesus told the disciples didn't sit well, especially with Peter. Peter actually tried to rebuke Jesus during his teaching, saying, no, you know, s stop talking like that. That's you know, that's, that's silly. You're, you're God. Um, Peter had stars in his eyes. He and the other disciples envisioned posts of glory and honor that they would have and occupy when Jesus brought in his kingdom. Um, and they thought that that included chasing out the Romans and reestablishing um, the peaceful days of King David and King Solomon. So when Jesus started talking about suffering many things, getting rejected by the very people um, of Israel 
and then dying. Well, it was like the roar in Peter's ears was so loud that he couldn't hear Jesus saying, and I will rise three days later. Because everything in Peter was just raging against the first part of what Jesus said. This is not, this is not what he had been taught. So Peter decided to teach Jesus about what Messiahship is. And, and again, re rebukes Jesus' doom and gloom talk. And Jesus is floored. <laughs> he, and rightfully so, uh, he, uh, he harshly rebukes Peter and, and even calls him Satan's helper. <laughs> um, but Jesus goes on to explain the real dynamic of the gospel. Jesus depicts an upside down, counterintuitive world. It's a world where living under the sentence of death, giving up on oneself, and losing one's life are the ticket to the top, or to the top by way of the bottom. In our passage in Mark 9, it's a week later, or uh, about there, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain. And in the Bible, the mountain um, often uh, is associated with closeness to God and a readiness to receive his word really important, significant things happen on mountaintops. God appeared to Moses on a mountain, and Elijah on the mountain. I wonder, I, I don't know the answer to this, um, if the disciples maybe expected something um, supernatural or extraordinary when they were going up, climbing up the mountain with Jesus. Well, <coughs> as we read, something did happen. Something extraordinary happened. Jesus transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, Elijah and Moses appeared to them and, and were talking with Jesus. The divinity of Jesus was, was so visible. But what um, Peter, James, and John, what they saw was less of a transfiguration or literally from the Greek, the trans, uh, metamorphosis. It, was, um, uh, it wasn't a transformation or metamorphosis of something that that Jesus was not normally. It was, it's really actually more of a, a revelation or an epi epiphany of who Jesus was and truly is all the time, even without his clothes sparkling. Uh, it's his divine and his human nature that are joined and, 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 and cannot be separated. So during Jesus' transfigur um, transfiguration and his revealing of his divine nature, Peter starts to speak. You think maybe he would kind of get the clue that maybe he should just wait and, and stop. And, and we don't really get to see at all what he was thinking, or even maybe his lack of thinking. Um, the Greek verb in chapter 5 and 6 um, is not the typical Greek verb um, that's used, that means to say or to speak, but it's actually um, a prokrithes which means to reply or answer. It seemed that Peter felt compelled by the scene in front of him to respond or to answer. And, and what he said was a little strange, uh, I'll give him that, but he suggested building three shelters, which are <laughs> probably better translated to tabernacles, which are the ancient Israelite uh, movable temples. Um, and, and we're also then told in verse six that that he didn't know what to say, and the disciples were so frightened. So I can imagine myself being there, and some kind of random word vomit comes out and, <laughs> and saying something kind of ridiculous. Um, Peter's response may have been to try to capture this beautiful, amazing moment. And, and maybe even today, we, if we were there, maybe we'd try to pull out our phone and take a video <laughs> or a picture. I mean, just, just as, as silly, I, I think. <laughs> The story continues, and the scene isn't over yet. God the Father makes an appearance. A, crowd, a, a cloud surrounds the disciples, and they're covered. And then God states, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And I don't know what kind of vocal intonation he used, but I can imagine it was pretty terrifying. Um, and... And I can imagine maybe the disciples saying, or 
thinking to themselves, listen to him? Are, are, you, are you serious? Did you just see what's happening? Did you mean look at him? Um, but, but the message is short and clear to the disciples. It's, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. The disciples have been called out. They've been, not been very good listeners. And then just as God's words probably start to penetrate some of their shock, they suddenly look around and, and Moses and Elijah are gone, the cloud's gone, and they're just alone there with Jesus. I can imagine just feeling so disoriented and, and just in shock, as the disciples probably were. It would be difficult to process what just happened. And Jesus understood what was happening inside the disciples. As they were walking down the mountain, Jesus commanded the disciples, Do not tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. I don't think this is like a harsh or um, a rebuke statement from Jesus, but, but it's one based on love and empathy for his very, very confused disciples. Jesus knew that he was turning their worldview, their, their understanding, upside down. And it was probably stressful and confusing and chaotic. And Jesus tells them, don't say anything to anyone. Because I can imagine them, the disciples, trying to explain to other people <laughs> what happened. And people would ask them questions and they'd get even more confused. I, I, I see this as a, as a caretaking, as a shepherding um, tap thing that Jesus did for his disciples. Even after the transfiguration, you'd think after something as miraculous as this, the disciples would get it. There's two more cycles of confusion. <laughs> Just in this, you know, chapters 8 through 10. So, the disciples still don't understand. The confusion and misunderstanding happen, and, and Jesus continues to reteach. We read later in Mark 9 that the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest, we also read in Mark 10 that John, James and John are requesting the two top position, positions in the future Jesus administration. <laughs> they just still are not listening. And we can be like the disciples. We can not listen. Too often we are too busy to listen. It's dangerous when we begin to think that we know better than God. We try to correct him. I don't know about you, but I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, just a little FYI for you. Um, I know in my own life, I spent many years um, with unnecessary anguish and shame and fear instead of, instead of celebrating God's gift and, and calling in my life. And sadly, I wish I could say that I've learned my lesson, but, but I haven't. Um, at times, I still try to tell God what is true and, and untrue and what how my life is going to go and how it's not going to go. I don't listen. But listening to Jesus is so vital. When Jesus says that he's a suffering servant and a servant leader, we have to believe it. Jesus is a humble example of the way that life is really meant to go in God's good order. And it's not up to us to brush aside any of those weak-sounding words of Jesus that, that don't seem to fit for us. And although we're like the disciples, our passage gives us and the disciples some hope. God hasn't given up on his seemingly thick disciples. He divinely reveals himself to the disciples during the transfiguration. And though they don't understand it at the time, the truth of Jesus Christ the Messiah, the suffering servant, would become clear. The transfiguration, or what I like to kind of call the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, is finally translated to the disciples through Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection from the dead. And Jesus doesn't give up, give up on his disciples. Through the gospel, we continue, Jesus continues to just. Jesus continues to teach, even despite their misunderstandings. 
and ridiculous arguments. Jesus' predictions and teachings about his death and resurrection become clear. Just as Jesus doesn't give up on the disciples, he doesn't give up on, on anyone here or anyone that he loves. God intervenes into our lives in ways that he did like, like he did 2,000 years ago. Sometimes it's like the razzle-dazzle with the gleaming lights and mountaintop experiences, but other times it's a little bit more subtle. But that doesn't mean that it's any less powerful, supernatural, beautiful, or truthful. And it may take a little hindsight to understand what that event, to be able to translate it or put it in the picture of God's overall plan for our lives. I believe that my experience with my pastor in that coffee shop was, was one of those times, that a divine moment. I, I tru truly don't think that actually my pastor even su fully supports women in office. Um, I remember sitting at his dinner table just a few years later after we had met in Iowa. Uh, he had moved to Michigan. And I was sitting at his dinner table with, with his wife, and his, his wife was saying, you know, we really like our church, except they have women deacons. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and I give a dollar less if a woman ever gives me the collection plate. And, and the, my pastor just kind of smiled. I don't remember how, exactly how the conversation go, but I remember thinking he was just smiling and seemed to be in agreement with her. And... And I wasn't at all, um, I wasn't really offended. I was a little shocked, but I, but I wasn't offended because at that point I was still in complete denial of my <laughs> calling to ordain the ministry. So I was just like, okay, that was strange. But, but I really believe that the Holy Spirit spoke through my pastor so that I could listen to God's message for my life. And I didn't listen the first time. <laughs> I didn't listen the second time. I didn't listen the third time. And it, it, it took years. But Jesus continues to teach all of us here through God's revealed will in the Bible, through the cloud of witnesses, those around us, the church. God has shown us how the pieces of his divine plan have been put together after the fall in the Garden of Eden to show God's plan for salvation and redemption for all of us. As we move into the season of Lent and prepare ourselves to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen. Listen to Christ and his message for us, the church. Christ has suffered, he has died, and he has risen from the dead for us. Listen. God, continue to teach us the truth of who you are. Thank you for not giving up on us. But you continue to reveal yourself as the Messiah and Savior to us. May we listen to your truth. Block out the noises that try to lead us away from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> You could turn to Psalter um, number 76. My love song is unknown.
the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Amen.